On Sunday the 30th of November 1997, taxi driver Eileen started off for work in Galway. It would be a long day, starting at 8am and at 8pm she would phone the taxi base to let them know she was bringing a fare to Clare Galway. At midnight her car would be found abandoned. Eileen Costello was from Corrafin in Galway. She had two brothers, PJ and Martin. At 20, she married Tom O'Shocknessy, a Garda with Mill Street Garda Station. The couple would go on to have two children, Susan and Damien. The couple would later divorce and it was said to be amicable. Eileen then moved back in with her mother, Nora, in Corrafin. The two seemed to get on really well together, you know, uh, knew each other's routines and stuff like that. Eileen was quite petite. Um, she had brown hair and big round glasses. She was described as witty, independent and cheerful. She loved dancing and playing cards and she wasn't said to be a big drinker. She tried her hand at a few different jobs including sales and hairdressing and around 1992 or 93 she got a job as a taxi driver. She worked for Galway Taxis and she loved it. Eileen was uh, said to be really chatty and talkative and so her family um, say that, you know, this would have been the ideal job for her uh, because you'd have a lot of different people to talk to. You'd be interacting with people all the time. It was quite a social job, as would the sales and hairdressing have been. So it kind of gives you an idea of how, you know, the personality she was. She was hardworking and very meticulous when it came to like the paperwork and the mileage and stuff like that. She worked days because this would have been more sociable hours, but also I suppose like the, the safety aspect of it. She was one of only 12 uh, taxi, female taxi drivers and she would always, you know, keep in, in touch with uh, the base throughout the day. Eileen suffered terribly with Crohn's disease, although it was said that she had started to find a way to manage the pain. She was religious, as was everyone in 90s Ireland. Um, and it was said that if she could find like a spare, you know, half hour during the day, she would go to mass rather than like have, have dinner or whatever. On Sunday, November 30th, 47-year-old Eileen started her day at 8am and had a busy morning of fairs. At around midday, she found herself back around Cara Finn, so she actually met a friend for lunch and then dropped in on her mother. While she was here, uh, her nephew, Kenny, who was Martin's son, had just come home from Australia, so had dropped in to see them. She then went back to work after this, and at around half two, she met a friend in the Skeffington Arms, and they met for a cup of tea, talked, she told them about Kenny coming home. She also spoke about her daughter Susan, who actually lived in London, but was on holidays uh, for a month in Australia and then would be coming home at Christmas um, to Ireland. So she was just telling her friend, you know, about that and how she was looking forward to seeing her daughter coming home. After this, she went back to work and at 6pm she was seen at Supermax going in to use the ladies' bathroom and grabbing a drink. At 7.30 p.m. she picked up her last known fare. At 7.59 p.m. Uh, Eileen rings her mother, rings home. Uh, so it said that she rang, but like it didn't go through, it didn't connect, so it never actually rang on the other end. Um, they're not sure like if this actually means anything, but it could be that, you know, she saw someone coming, like a, a fare or something, you know, or someone to talk, you know, someone who knew her or whatever. Someone come to talk around, you know, you know yourself, you might be about to ring someone. And especially if it's not maybe an important call and it hasn't started ringing yet. You know, you might just all oh, ring them back in a few minutes or whatever. Especially if it's a fair, she's nearly finished, you know, probably get, a, get the last few bits of, you know, money in. At 8pm, she is seen speaking to an unknown, unknown woman at the Cross Street and Key Street Junction. Um, she then informs the base that she is taking a fair to Clare Galway. This is a 20 minute journey, so like roughly 20 minutes later, the base actually then rang Eileen to, to tell her like there was a fair in Clare Galway to pick up, but Eileen didn't answer. So I'll just point out, um, Eileen actually shared a taxi with someone called Christy O'Neill. I'm not, some say like boss, so I'm not sure if it was actually her boss or just like a colleague, but the impression I get is he took her car then for the day or whatever, and she would use his taxi and then they would swap back over, you know, he'd take his taxi back for the night shift and then she'd she'd take her car home. So she was actually supposed to meet uh, Christy at 9pm on the Dyke Road. And so when she didn't arrive, he, he got worried. 
I'm guessing that, you know, he was trying to ring her. Maybe the base was trying to ring her. So her colleagues were getting worried. So they started actually driving around looking for her. In the meantime, Eileen's mother, Nora, had rang her. And like that, she didn't answer. So she just kept ringing her over and over. It said that she just kept ringing her. And she didn't notice until the sun started coming up. Um, I'm kind of... I'm kind of a little confused then if they if maybe no one rang home to check if she was home or you know what the story was like why that wasn't kind of a, a thing that was considered I'm not really sure it doesn't say then at 11 44 p.m taxi number 34 was found by three workers at the Leiden House Bakery now I just want to uh, clarify a little thing here because I, I usually try to put up like Google Maps images and stuff so people can kind of have an idea of distances and where things are and stuff um when you google Leiden House Bakery it shows up in like Galway city centre like on an actual street and so when I looked I was like oh that's that seems a bit odd and I, I because in my head I thought it was like on a, on a road outside the city centre and I read through all like my stuff again and it is like every time it's described it's on the N17 or you know it's it's on the outskirts of the city or whatever. And in one, it's actually described as being um, beside a restaurant. And when I look at the restaurant, that shows me outside the city, but it shows me like a new area, like a new pub or something. So again, I think because, you know, or it's over 20 years ago, uh, I don't know, maybe the bakery moved or they had a, you know, a premises outside as well. I'm not really sure, but for the context of this, I'm going that it is on the outskirts because all the sources describe it that way. But if I'm wrong, I apologise and maybe someone can correct me. So the window of the car was open and the key was actually still in the ignition. And because the car was actually parked kind of dodgy, one of the workers like got in, you know, to, to move the car. And that's when they saw like the blood all over the seat and the armrest. It was clear that a violent attack had taken place. So the Gardaí were called and they established that the driver was Eileen uh, Costello O'Shaughnessy. And so they began searching for her. Now again, I kind of... I'm kind of a little curious is did they not they had to have checked her home like and and checked in with her mother to see you know where she was or something I'm not really sure none of the sources kind of seem to establish that I just know that it says that Nora was up all night ringing her daughter the following day at noon farmer Parag O'Connell was out checking stock at Nocto Moor just off the N17 when he came across the body of Eileen Eileen's body was found in a boring called Tinker's Lane in Nocturne Moor, which was about 15 miles outside of Galway City. The post-mortem was performed by the state pathologist, Dr. John Harbison. It showed there had been a vicious assault on Eileen and there were severe injuries to her head. It was said that she was unrecognisable. They believe a blunt force instrument was used, but um, through any searches or anything, this was never found. Eileen was fully dressed and there was no signs of sexual assault so Gardy don't believe that this was a motive. So the car had blood all over it. Uh, the meter had either so, some sort of say it was ripped out and some say that it had been attempted to be ripped out. The bum bag that Eileen usually wore around her waist was on the um, floor of the driver's seat. Uh, there's no mention of money being in it and it's believed that the takings were you know had been stolen but there was like a, a you know like a plastic container or whatever that would have had like the, the change in it so like pound uh, pound coins and like 50p coins and stuff and in fairness that could have made up 10 20 30 pound so again they don't even really think robbery was a motive because they kind of think well why didn't they take the coins but again i don't know if you're if you're just killing someone to rob them and you're in a panic would you just rob the notes i'm not sure they believe the takings would have been less than £100, so they reckon kind of only £70 or £80. And again, they don't know if this would be enough of a motive to kill someone. Now, in fairness, I think people out there are willing to kill people for a fiver. So £70 or whatever, which is about €100 Euro or so now, I think that is enough of a, you know, a reason to rob someone. It turns out after that teenagers had actually come by the car before the the factory workers had and they seen the mobile phone and cigarettes and they actually took them and they couldn't get the phone to work or they couldn't I don't know if it would have been locked at that time but apparently they couldn't they couldn't use it so they smashed it but again this goes back to the kind of robbery motive of you know if you're robbing someone why didn't you take the phone as well the last fair shows that there would have been about 16 miles 
um, which would have been kind of the distance from where she had been in the city centre out to Knoxville Moor. They established Eileen's time of death was between 8 and 10 p.m. The Rover 60 Gardaí involved in, in the investigation. They actually found blood and footprints about four miles up in a quarry uh, from Tinker's Lane. They examined CCTV of the Tomb Galway Road, which was the main road uh, on the N17. That came up nothing. They interviewed thousands and chased down all of Eileen's passengers for that day. And some witnesses did come forward with different sightings that they had seen of the taxi. So at 8 p.m. we have the unknown woman that she was talking to in city centre. This woman never came forward. I'm not sure of the timing of this next uh, witness, but about three miles outside of the city at Holmes Hill, the taxi was seen on the hard shoulder uh, with its lights on and its taxi plate on. Again, I'm not sure of a specific time on this, but the taxi was seen turning right at Mystical Rose Nursing Home, which was at the junction of the Tomb, Galway Road and Tinker's Lane, and it didn't use its indicator. At 8.30pm, a woman with blonde hair was seen on the N17 walking towards Galway City. It was close to Tinker's Lane. It was said that she seemed to be distressed or distracted. Again, this woman has never come forward. And then at 8.45 or 9pm, because one source says 9pm uh, in a documentary, and then the Garda site itself says 8.45, which is close enough, but I'm just, I'll just say it. Um, a witness noticed a taxi, registration 97G6663, driving erratically on the N17. The witness motorist then overtook the taxi as it was pulling into Lydon's Bakery. They saw a man driving who looked to be in his 30s to 50s with dark hair and a dark beard. He, They said he wasn't big and he had a flat face. I'm not really sure what a flat face means, but that's what they said he had. Again at 9pm, uh, so maybe the last sighting would have more likely been 8.45ish. At 9pm, a witness who was actually closing a shop across the road from Lydon's saw a man jumping down off the wall near Lydon's. He then walked towards Galway City. He was said to be in his 20s, uh, 5 foot 10 or 5 foot 11, short red hair and that his beard had like a few days growth on it. He was average build and he was carrying like a cream or beige canvas sports bag. At 9.10pm, a witness saw a young man in the field walking towards Tyrolin and it appeared and appeared lost. Um, it was a wet night and so he noticed that like they were walking in the field and not on the path. Around 2am, a small red car was seen uh, like reversing into Tinker's Lane with the lights off and then like speeding off. Again, the owner of this car has never come forward. So none of these people have ever come forward. So these are like the main you know, appeals that are put out for information on Eileen. One source said that a woman uh, was picked up hitchhiking in Knockdomor at around midnight and that she seemed very upset. Now, whether this could have been confusion with the woman earlier in the day, um, because that woman could have been technically hitchhiking if she was walking along the hard shoulder, I'm not really sure, or if it's a different woman, or it is the same woman, but from different scenarios I'm not sure but in the source that says that they actually say that the guardie have ruled that person out even though the person never came forward they have said that they ruled that person out which seems a bit weird to me now I'll just say because a lot of the time the husband can be suspect and um, it is said that Tom O'Shock Missy was actually in uh, Dublin on the Monday so he had to get the call in in Dublin um, to come home so I don't know if that means he was only there on Monday or you know, had he been there for the weekend or whatever amount of time he was there. But anyway, there's never any mention of him being him being a suspect or any type of thing like that. So maybe they just immediately ruled him out. As I said, they say the divorce was amicable. So Eileen seems calm when she phoned the base and said that she had a fair going to Claire Galway. So, you know, did she know the killer? Did she know the person who was in the car with her? And that's why she didn't seem tense or worried or anything like that. Also, let's say, I don't know, let's say they had you know, someone was robbing you or, or stick, you know, holding you up for the for the car or something. If you genuinely believe that they were just going to rob you or whatever, would they tell you not to say, you know, not to say anything? Maybe you wouldn't say anything in the car. You know, maybe you wouldn't tell anyone. You're not going to, you know, 
risk harming yourself by alerting someone on the phone then you might just be like oh i'll just get this over with let them rob the car or let them rob me or whatever i don't know gary believed that the killer was local because um that lane tinkers lane they said like you'd have to know it they said there's no way that you would just happen to come across it where it was it was also a like popular spot for couples so they say no you know no one came forward to say they saw anything that night and that kind of leads back to the red car could the red car have been something to do with the murder or could it have like that could it have been a couple who you know uh, were going off for a little time of their own but then like what like what happened that they sped off did they see the body and just run off without telling anybody now the guy said that no one has come forward even though they've like assured confidentiality so maybe that's the case that you know like could it have been could it have been like a married you know a couple having an affair or something because i've heard that happening before where that's why witnesses don't come forward for stuff maybe that could be the thing why if the if the red car had saw a body or something that they wouldn't have rang because then they'd have to kind of admit where they were and who they were with or something um but if it was if it was a fact that the red car was involved why are you going back at 2 a.m like either you're going back at 2 a.m to leave the body then but it's believed that her car went to Tinker's Lane and that that's where the assault happened. So I'm not really sure. Superintendent Tony Finnerty said that the murder showed like it was committed by someone, you know, of an unstable nature. With the amount of blood that was in the car, the killer or killers, whoever was involved, would have had to have had blood on them. And so like that, you know, Gardy believe there are people, there are more witnesses. They believe there are people who know that they haven't come forward. Because if your friend, boyfriend, husband, father, son, uncle, you know, anything like that, not being sexist, obviously, like could have been, could have been a girl, but anybody comes home and has like loads of blood on them or something, why, first of all, why are you not questioning them about it? And also, like, why aren't you coming forward, especially now when you know that this horrific crime has happened? So they definitely believe that there are people out there who know something and they're not they're not coming forward and to go back to that like did Eileen drive to Tinker's Lane because that's kind of one of the things that sticks in my mind did Eileen actually drive to Tinker's Lane and that's where the assault happened did they assault her earlier and then like that had her body in the car but then I feel like maybe that had to have been more than one person and that's a very isn't that a very messy thing like if you kill if you if you attacked her or killed her somewhere else and then like you would have had to take over driving so you would have had to move her from the car you definitely would have gotten gotten blood all over you then and then you drove to tinker's lane and it was just it just kind of came into my head while i was talking there um when she was seen at the when the taxi was seen at the hard shoulder at holmes hill if that had been you know because that was only three miles out of the city so maybe if the assault had happened there could it have been that they were trying to just rob her and they hit her too ha- too hard, you know, and she didn't just, you know, go unconscious or she didn't just kind of give up, she she died. And maybe then, like, that the panic is, like, what do we do? Like, and they just drove and were like, well, I know, I know this kind of little small lane that no one will find her or something like that. I don't know, but then why wouldn't you leave the car there? I suppose you probably can't walk back all the way on your own. Maybe that was like, well, we'll, we'll bring it to the factory or something i don't know but i find it odd that she would willingly drive to tinker's lane herself especially because if she was local she would have known what it was like so i mean would you willingly drive there knowing that the prospects doesn't look good or like that if you thought they were really just robbing you that you just believed they were just gonna you know let you off somewhere isolated kind of so that you couldn't you couldn't call the guards or whatever, you know, on them straight away. Something like that, maybe. Susan had to be phoned when she was in Australia and told about her mother's death. And she, you know, got home as soon as she could. Eileen's funeral was then held on December 5th. Her son Damien actually moved in with his grandmother, Nora. Nora had actually lost another daughter uh, as an infant. So this was now her second child. Um, and it said that, you know, the family said that she just, she never got over it and she died 11 years later they say of a broken heart 
the taxi drivers in Galway all wore like a black armband, um, you know, to show solidarity with their lost co colleague. Um, a £30,000 reward was actually put up by the Irish Taxi Federation, Crime Stoppers and Local Businesses. Again, £30,000, you're probably talking close to 40 grand, like in euros. There was a fresh appeal in 2013. Um, so taxi drivers, you know, put posters up uh, for justice for Eileen. There were TV, radio and newspaper appeals. And a website was set up in memory of Eileen. And then there was a part on it where you could actually like anonymously give information. And so like a tip came through from that. And a witness said that they saw two men crossing the green at College Street wearing hoods and dark clothes around the time of the murder. Again, is this connected? Is it not? Like that was the two men because the other witnesses, there was two descriptions. There was a man with the dark hair and the dark beard in his 30s to 50s. And then the other man was in his 20s and he had short red hair and a beard. Now, the only thing I will say is, I think if you're driving along, especially like that, it's it will be night time. It's November at around eight, nine o'clock at night. It's November. It's dark here. Um, so it will be dark. As we've said, it was wet. If a car in front of you is kind of driving erratically anyway, you're going to be a bit like sketch. And then so as you overtake them, you know, if they're in the car, it's dark. I don't know if you would know the difference between, you know, red hair and dark hair, really. Because they're not going to have their little light on or anything. It's going to be dark. So, you know, maybe their hair just looked dark. And that could have been the same man. And again, you could, you know, he could have just looked between 30s and 50s. Like, you know, witnesses obviously do their best. But, like, I don't know if I'd know the difference between a 20-year-old and a 40-year-old. Especially these days, there are teenagers who look 30. So, sometimes ages are a bit weird. But it could have been the same man. You know, because... Both men had beards, you know what I mean? So it could have been the same man, might not have been the same man, could have been two involved. But then, like, if there was two involved, why was only one seen jumping down from the bakery, you know? Like, why wasn't there two men seen in the car, you know, this type of thing? Again, why wasn't there two men seen walking through that field behind the witness's house? So could it have just been one man? But then, like, what does that girl have to do with it? Does she have anything to do with it? I don't know, could, could it have been a case of the girl was used as bait to kind of get Eileen to go somewhere, especially because like she might trust the girl more to go somewhere later at night. You know, but then, like, did she panic then when, when things went wrong and, and Eileen died, when she was only supposed to have been injured or something? Like, and is that why she was kind of like, I'm going or I'm getting out of the car? Or We don't know. That could be a thing, though. Let's say... At the hard shoulder, um, remember I say in a Holmes Hill, maybe if, if the assault had happened there, could could the girl or whoever then have panicked and been like, no, I'm not, I'm not dealing with this. Like, yeah, it's just, there's so many, so many un unanswered questions. In just two men that came up as like suspects when I was searching the case, um, different news articles. I'll start with the less likely one. So in a May 2004 article, a killer in the UK, Philip Smith, who was actually in prison for three murders, he apparently went on like a 96-hour spree and at one point had lived in Athlone here in Ireland. So I think they were trying to connect his timeline of being in Ireland with, you know, any any crimes we had here and could it have been something. So he's kind of been linked to Eileen. Now, I think Gardy travelled over to see him, but I couldn't find any more other than that article from May 2004. In July 2001, a um, murderer called Thomas Murray, so he had actually killed uh, like a, a farmer, a pensioner, when he was 17 in 1981. And in 1997, he was out on like, he was either out on probation or day release, it keeps saying, and it says he was working as a labourer. Now at that time, he would have been 33 ish and apparently the guardie had actually like immediately thought of him when this uh, when this all happened they thought of him as a suspect um because apparently like the guardie have said that he he's extremely vicious and violent and he should never be he shouldn't be let out and apparently like that because he had been in jail since he was 17 the guardie had kind of thought like well he couldn't have driven the car because he would never have you know he wasn't out he wouldn't have known how to but apparently he learned how to drive in prison 
Now, I don't know, so it doesn't really talk about at the time them thinking it was him or any or any actions being taken. But in July 2001, so kind of nearly four years later, uh, he was back in prison, in Castlery Prison, now for another murder that he committed while out on either probation or day release for the p- murder of the pensioner. He had then killed uh, a retired school teacher. And it actually, I think it said like it was it was like his former teacher. And so he was back in prison. And so they actually like arrested him in prison and questioned him for 12 hours. And it is said that he had an alibi, but that the alibi at the time was like, you know, where he had to lodge or whatever. But it came out later then that the people who were there, who said that they were there, had actually left for a while. And they left for like between like seven and nine or something. So they were kind of saying it was enough time for him to have done it. But again, nothing more. I tried to search more on it and I can't. Um, I'll put up a photo that I found, which I believe is to do it like later on. He looks a lot older, so I don't know if it's like a later trial or something that's going on. But he doesn't look like in his 30s, to be honest. So I don't know if you can really judge what he would have looked like at the time that Eileen was murdered to kind of say oh yeah that looks like what the witness said or whatever but I'll put them up anyway and you can see what you think. Unfortunately that's kind of where we are with the case of Eileen Costello O'Shaughnessy. Um, you know there doesn't there seems to be so many kind of strange unanswered questions and I feel unless people come forward now who know stuff it's not going to get solved. Like, her mother has already died, not knowing what happened to her daughter. You know, her brothers are, you know, older now as well. You know, her children are wondering what happened to their mother. So, if you have any information, no matter how insignificant and small you think it is, please call the numbers below and let the, let, let the family know. This is another one, obviously, that I hope will be solved. I just wish 2021 is going to just bring so much information and so much closure for families. It would be just be, wouldn't it just be wonderful? So thank you for watching and listening. Um, please, if you have not already, uh, subscribe and let me know what you think of the case. Do you think it was the same guy? Do you think there was two guys? Was the girl involved? You know, let me know what you think of the case. Let me know what you think of the video. And yeah. See you in the next video. Thanks. Slam.